morning. Welcome uh, on this bright and sunny, um, brisk morning. Uh, feel free to stand up and get your blood moving if you need to at any point. Um, if our Lutheran calisthenics don't get you to do that enough anyway uh, during worship, but we are glad you are with us, whether it is uh, here in the parking lot or joining us through Facebook um, or uh, Zoom. Uh, and those of you who will be joining us virtually uh, throughout the week, we um, are excited about the different ways that we are learning to be church together um, while sometimes apart. Uh, that is important and good. Uh, we have a number of announcements. Um, the first is thank you to everyone who participated in our God's Work, Our Hands um, movement. It was kind of like a movement this year versus just one Sunday. Um, we've gotten a number of pictures. We'll still collect pictures for a couple of days. Um, and with uh, you doing service in your yellow shirts, but just remember that um, God's Work, Our Hands is a way of living. It's not um, only reserved for 20 days in the month of September. So um, continue to do those good acts um, for your neighbors, for your family, for those who may be in need. Um, and remember to send us whatever it is you might have done so that we can um, keep track of that and then celebrate that next month in our um, newsletter. Uh, secondly, we are changing things up a little bit in terms of our schedule and offerings here. Uh, so we have two new weekly events that are starting this week. Uh, the first is that on Mondays from 4 until 6 p.m., you can drive through under this portico here, and I will be um, just inside those doors waiting. Um, if you would like to receive or have a time for either... Um, a bit of private confession or prayer, and then receive Holy Communion. Um, we will do that from within your car. Uh, you'll remain there. If there's others in your car with you, um, you'll be with the driver or the main passenger. will distribute to everyone in the car from me. Um, but we just recognize that, that for some that is a need, um, maybe particularly for those who are worshiping with us in ways that are not directly here, um, but know that all of you are also always welcome. So we're going to start that on Mondays, um, and we're just going to see how it goes. We don't have a, um, you know, a, a deadline. It'll be for at least a month, but just know, um, maybe put that in your calendar. You can stop um, on your way home from work or on your way out to pick up dinner. Um, and we did that time figuring that it'll still have plenty of daylight for those of you um, if this continues for a while, we don't like to drive in the dark, um, but it just gives us a time to be together as pastor and congregation. The second um, thing is that we are revamping our coffee hour um, from Thursday mornings and we're turning it into happy hour. Um, so instead of joining us at 9 a.m. on Thursdays, I see some of you are like, yeah, it's happening. To, I'm excited. That's what we were hoping for. So instead of 9 a.m. Thursday mornings, tune in at 5 o'clock uh, Thursday evenings um, through Zoom. Honestly, if you're making dinner, pour a glass of wine or milk or water or tea or whatever it is that um, you would love to be drinking and, and just tap on. You don't have to commit for the whole hour, um, but I promise that myself or someone else um, we'll always be on from 5 to 6 on Thursday evenings just to do a check-in, share some laughs, share some stories. There's no set schedule or agenda for those. Book studies and Bible studies continue as normal uh, throughout the week. Is there youth group? No. no youth group tonight. Youth group will be next week. No. Ne not next week. No. Youth group will be like later. No. It'll happen later. Um, next weekend is also a dairy box distribution. So watch your um, email um, to get those in advance um, pre-registered as well. Ooh, that was a lot. Did I miss anything? 12 weeks of Christmas. 12 weeks of Christmas. Thank you, Carol. Um, thank you to those of you who brought um, in donations already. Uh, this week we are, we are collecting snack food, so granola bars or individually wrapped bags of chips or pretzels, um, just no fruit snacks. Um, and 
John and Carol will be back, or one of them at least will be back here on Tuesday from 9 to 11 a.m. Um, if you didn't grab that bag on your way out the door this morning or if you're watching from home, um, so you'll be able to still bring that. And then next week we are collecting pancake mix and syrup. Pancake mix and syrup. Um, so add that to your click list and uh, your grocery list um, and bring in um, a box or a bottle or two of those um, for our, our community here. Great. I invite us to prepare our hearts and minds for worship uh, while we listen to a prelude this morning. Please stand if you are able. And we begin our worship this morning with our confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who creates, redeems, and sustains us and all of creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Faithful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from your loving embrace and go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors. We keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble, cast away our transgressions, and turn us again to life in you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Beloved, God hears the cries of all who call out in need. And through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth that God proclaims. Your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. 
Led by the Holy Spirit, let us live in freedom and newness to do God's work in the world. Amen. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, you show perpetual loving kindness to us, your servants. Because we cannot rely on our own abilities, grant us your merciful judgment and train us to embody the generosity of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated as we hear God's word for our lives this morning. better okay sorry so this is my normal scarf wearing um this is what i do when i'm at work in my office and nobody's with me so i hope this is okay um, our first reading today is from jonah chapter three after jonah's short sermon in three four the ninevites all repented and god decided to spare the city Jonah objected to this and became even more angry when God ordered a worm to destroy a plant that was providing shade. The book ends with a question that challenges any who are not ready to forgive. You, Jonah, are worked up about a bush, but shouldn't I be concerned about 120,000 Ninevites? The reading begins. When God saw the people of Nineveh, what God uh, did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out to the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush, so it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But Jonah said, but God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor, in which you did not grow. And it came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals. The word of the Lord. Our second reading is from Philippians chapter 1. 
Paul writes to the Philippians from prison, though he is uncertain about the outcome of his imprisonment, he is committed to the ministry of the gospel and calls on the Philippians to live lives that reflect and enhance the gospel mission. For to me, living in Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which I prefer. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing, for he has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well. Since you are having the same struggle that I saw I had, and now hear that I still have. The word of the Lord. Thank you, Anne. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. And when he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to the manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. <clears throat> now, when the first when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner saying, these last worked only one hour and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last, the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. I'm 
a really big fan of contestant-based reality shows. <laughs> Some of you are shaking your head at me already. <laughs> yes, Karen, I really am. <laughs> and you know what I'm talking about. It's the kind where every week the same group of people come together and they compete against one another with these maybe somewhat crazy challenges. And then there's a winner and there's a loser. And the loser goes home at the end of the show every week. They are everywhere on TV. They started uh, pretty much when the writer's strike in Hollywood happened 10 or 15 years ago now. But you know what I'm talking about, right? They're the, it's the Dancing with the Stars, or the American Idol, or the Skin Wars, or America's Next Top Model, or the Great British Baking Show, right? We have entire networks dedicated to these kinds of TV shows. And I know that my love for these shows absolutely started with Project Runway. There was a group of us when I was in seminary who committed to watching this together every week. It was sort of our, our one hour of time together where we knew we wouldn't schedule anything else, we wouldn't worry about the next paper due, and we would just come together and watch this silly reality competitive show where clothing designers come together to become America's next top fashion designer. The season always starts with a variety of people. Some of them are from big cities. Some of them are from places we've never heard of. Some of them uh, are self-taught. Others have gone to school for years. Some have just sort of figured out how to make material and sewing machines and other craft things work well for them, and everybody always has a big, crazy personality. Does anybody else like these kinds of shows, or is it just me? Please, please confess with me today. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, okay. So each episode of Project Runway, specifically, the designers need to to complete a challenge, right? They have to create a ball gown, or they have to create an, ins an outfit inspired by dance, or they have to create um, something, uh, some sort of costume that can only, and they can only use arts and crafts supplies. They can't actually use any actual material for this. And it's always in what seems like an impossible time frame, right? And then, they all go down to the judging area where there's a runway show and this handful of judges chooses a winner and a loser and one week at a time the number of designers gets smaller and smaller and it's great. <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> I had forgotten how much I loved these kinds of shows until you know, relatively recently, as I'm desperately scrolling through all of our different streaming networks, trying to find a new guilty pleasure during this pandemic. And as I was um, indulging in yet another episode recently, uh, I have found a show about body painting. It's fascinating. <laughs> I realized while I was watching this how much the designers spend their time talking to the cameramen and women about the other designers and their work instead of their own creative process or, or ideas, right? And, and generally, I'm, I realize that the ones who do the most comparing, the ones who are more often than not looking at everybody else around the room are the ones who inevitably get sent home. If not in that first episode where you realize how compar comparative they are, then certainly in the next. They get all caught up in what their neighbor was doing to focus on you know, the material or the design or the challenge they have in front of them. Now, I'm not a fashion designer by any means, but brothers and sisters, I compare myself to others all the time. 
And I think we all do. I think it's become our culture. I think it's actually become um, a normal, a normalized thing to do that we are judging ourselves against one another. And we are flooded with opportunities to see the greener grass over the fence. Whether it's the seemingly more happy marriages that our friends are in, or the way that our neighbors have seemed to set up a really cute and functional dedicated workspace for their kids who are learning virtually. And we're just lucky that we can like move all of the things that they needed for school that day off the dining room table and put plates on it instead for dinner, right? We judge when, we, when there are promotions that we are passed over for at work and sometimes even uh, make note of the next new car that our in-laws are driving instead of us. We are constantly provided time to compare ourselves to others in this world. Our family, our friends, celebrities, total strangers, it's all over the place. And I think perhaps now more than ever, that's because so many of us are spending more time connected, sort of, on the internet with each other, whether it's to do our actual work and vocation right now, or if it's simply because we can't stop doom scrolling all of the time. I know that you don't all use social media, but many of you do. And I bring this up a little bit with irony because we're using social media to help and gather others in worship this morning, and we have been for months. So think about the last time that you saw something on social media, and if you don't use it, think about the last advertisement you saw anywhere. Or the last thing that you posted. Was it to show off? How many selfies or pictures do you or your grandkids make you take before they say, yeah, that one can go up in public? <laughs> Super guilty. It's usually about six for me. <laughs> Maybe, though, it's not about you so much. Maybe it was you saw the same inspirational quote, but it was presented in a new way, and you thought, ooh, I'm going to share that one. Or you read an inspirational story and you wished you had the courage to do whatever that inspirational thing was. Maybe you witnessed someone sharing their gift of music in some way and you wished that that was your skill instead of theirs. We are constantly comparing ourselves and judging ourselves against one another. And there's a lot of potential bad theology when it comes to comparing ourselves with others, particularly in the eyes of God. And I'm pretty sure I said it last week. We don't have time right now or, or the energy right now for crappy theology in our lives. If we understand that theology is simply the word that means we are talking about how God shows up in the lives of God's people in this world, then it's almost too easy to see how theology could go really well or really terribly very quickly when we're using it as a form of judgment. It's remarkably easy, I think, when we're comparing ourselves to others to think or talk badly about the way that God is working in the world and assume it's God who's just doling out all of the good things to the good people. Because God certainly gives good things to God's children. But that doesn't mean God only gives to God's children. And it doesn't mean that we, 
God's children get to decide who should get whatever it is that's seen as the better thing. Deciding what God should or shouldn't do based on our behavior is bad theology. Not realizing that every good thing we have, every good thing we have, no matter if it's, if it's not the newest or the shiniest or the brightest, it's still a gift from God. That's a bad way to look at grace. Comparing ourselves against one another, whether we do so in the name of God or not, isn't a faithful way to show God's love to the world. Because whether we tend to relate to the laborers in the vineyard who have worked all day long, or the laborers who only worked for that last hour, the landowner simply gives a fair day's wage. Enough. God always gives enough. Every time we gather together, whether it's in worship or for meetings or on council or many of you in your individual lives at home, pray, give us this day our daily bread. Enough. And God does. So how do we quit acting like the laborers who work all day and then whine about the opportunity to serve? Or how do we learn to show our gratitude when we do have enough, even if it's not as much as we wish we had? I mean, really, what do we do to remember that we are the children of God and that is more than enough. I think maybe we start by confessing that our systems of worth and value in our culture are absolutely broken. When we name the brokenness that is sin in our lives, as uncomfortable as that tends to make us, we are more apt to at least pay a little bit more attention when it rears its ugly head inside of us. And by confessing the brokenness in which we compare ourselves to others as a way to determine who should get God's grace, we get to hear the words that that God forgives us all our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. And hearing we are forgiven may just allow us a few moments to experience not judgment or jealousy, but instead gratitude, that deep and abiding thankfulness for all that we have, whether it's our abilities or our opportunities, our talents or the people and even the unexpectedness of right now. That's one real concrete plan that I just named. And for some of you, that may be enough. But beloveds, I struggled to come up with even that plan. Because I have also thought particularly this week, and this is an area where I will be in that struggle with each of you, that maybe taking a personal sabbatical from those spaces where I am most likely to compare myself to others, and therefore where I am most likely to behave like an all-day laborer could probably do me some good. And I don't know what that might mean for your lives. I'm still trying to figure it out for my own. But taking time to intentionally stop looking for things that I don't need, 
or I don't have, or I didn't even know that I might want, might give me space to create joy for others. It might give me time to think about the grace I've received. It might help me sleep better at night. Maybe you already practiced some of ideas. God bless you if you do. Share those with the world. Or maybe they're not the right ideas for you, but I've sparked something this morning. God bless you for that. Share that with the world. The struggle with living in community is that we live in it. We live in it, which means that we are always seeing others around us. And sometimes that means we have to face the brutal truth together that life isn't always fake. But when we face that truth together, we're also reminded that we are always already enough. That's the beauty of grace. It's absolutely not fair. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please stand if you are able and let us profess our faith in the triune God using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Pray with me, please. Generous God, you make the last first and the first last. For this gospel, good news challenges the church, equip it for its works of service, and strengthen those who suffer for Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Sun and wind, bushes and worms, cattle and great cities. Nothing in creation is outside your concern, mighty Lord. In your mercy, tend to it all. Give us a spirit of generosity toward all you have made. Lord, in your mercy. Where we find envy and create enemies, you provide enough for all. Bring peace to the many places of conflict and violence throughout this world. Inspire leaders with creativity and wisdom. Bless the work of negotiators, peacekeepers, and development workers. Lord, in your mercy. Reveal yourself to all in need as you are gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, ready to relent from punishing. Accompany judges and lawyers, victims of crime and those serving sentences, and give fruitful labor and a livelihood to all who are seeking work. Lord, in your mercy. 
Even beyond our expectations, you choose to give generously. Grant life, health, courage, and grace to all who are in need. This morning, we especially remember before you the family of Tom Meyer, Nancy, Mary, and all those we name before you now in our hearts and on our lips. Lord, in your mercy. We praise you for the generations that have declared your power to us. Give us faithfulness to follow them, living for Christ, until you call us to join them in the joyful song around his throne. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated, and I invite you to prepare your tables of bread. Uh, a reminder, if you need uh, bread for communion this morning, we have wafers available just over here to my left. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We remember this morning that it was on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. And he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And gathered into one by the Holy Spirit with all the saints and across time and space, we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever amen let us feast on god's meal of grace for us Let us pray. We give you thanks, gracious God, that you have once again fed us with food beyond compare, the body of Christ. Lead us from this place, nourished and forgiven into your beloved vineyard, to wipe away the tears of all who hunger and thirst, guided by the example of the same Jesus Christ, and led by the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Please stand for the benediction. May Mother in God, Father, Son,
time and Holy Spirit bless you and lead you into the way of truth and life. Amen. You may be seated for the postlude. Go in peace. Remember the poor. Thanks be to God.